Good morning and welcome to the first meeting at the Education and Skills Committee in 2019. Can I take this opportunity to wish everyone a happy new year? Um, can I remind everyone to turn their mobile phones and other devices to silent in case they interfere with the broadcasting? Uh, agenda, agenda item one today is declaration of interest. We've received apologies from Gordon MacDonald and his substitute today is Gil Patterson, who is attending committee for the first time. So I therefore welcome Mr Patterson and invite him to make any declaration of interest. Uh, could I refer to my uh, declaration of interest around the public record and I have no additions to that in regards to my meeting here. Thank you and welcome. Uh, agenda item two is a decision to take business in private. Um, we would like to take uh, agenda item four in private today and whether to take future considerations of evidence on the SNSA inquiry in private. Are they content to take agenda item four and all future items in private? Thank you very much. Agenda item three is Scottish National Standardised Assessment Inquiry. And um, I, it's the first week of the committee's inquiry and we're starting by hearing from a panel of witnesses including those involved in designing and delivering standardised assessments. So I welcome this morning Mary Shaw, Director of Education East Renfrewshire Council on behalf of the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland, ADES. Juliet Mendelovitz, sorry, <laughs> Director of Assessment and Reporting for the Australian Council of Education Research, ACER. Professor Sue Ellis, Professor of Education for the University of Strathclyde, and Professor Christine Merrill, Professor in the School of Education and Deputy Head of the Faculty of Social Science and Health of Durham University. A very warm welcome to you all this morning. Um, can I just be begin by asking you to say just briefly what, what your involvement is in SNSAs and, um, and then we'll move on to detailed questions from the panel. So if, if I could just start with yourself, Mary. Thanks. Morning, convener. Thank you. Um, as Director of Education, obviously, I oversee that within East Renfrewshire, although not directly involved in it. And uh, as a member of ADES, obviously, um, continue to monitor its implementation to see how we can make best use out of those uh, assessments uh, on a, both a, a local and a national level. Thank you. Um, Professor Mendelovitz? I'm Juliet Mendelovitz from ACER. Um, until October 2018, I was the research director and general manager for ACR UK, which is an independent company but subsidiary of ACR Group. Um, in that capacity, I was the person who put together our bid for the SNSA, as it became, and led the um, implementation and development of SNSA for the three years until I went returned to Melbourne. So I'm now based back in Melbourne as a research director in. ACR group at large, but I still have a very strong connection and recent connection with the SNSAs. Thank you. Um, Professor Ellis? Hello, I'm um, Sue Ellis from the University of Strathclyde. Um, I was involved in some early meetings around assessment um, as a result of the um, Joseph Roundtree report we put on, on closing the poverty attainment gap uh, in Scotland. And one of the things about writing that report was that we noticed that there was no way of actually assessing whether or not any initiative had closed or widened the gap because there was no data. So that report did call for better data in schools. And as a result of that, I think I attended three meetings on assessment at, for Scottish Government. Thank you. And finally, um, Professor Meadow. Hi, um, I'm from Durham University and until the 1st of July last year in 2018, um, I was the Director of Research in the Centre for Evaluation and Monitoring, which provides standardised um, assessments as part of monitoring systems for schools and several, many, many hundreds of schools in Scotland have used those assessments since about 1996. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move to questions. From the committee members, I'll go to Liz Smith first. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think before we get into some of the detail about the evidence that you've submitted to the committee, I think what we are generally interested in in this parliament just now is some of the criteria uh, that make for good quality assessment. And uh, Professor Ellis has just flagged up the fact that it, it, it's, it, it's very important that we have good quality data, and that didn't exist at the time. 
Um, could you give us your views as to whether you think that data is getting better and what else you have to do to ensure that parents and pupils and teachers specifically understand exactly what it is that makes for good quality assessment? I think we'd be very interested in sort of general parameters there. Yep. I think it's a general comment. First and foremost, we need to consider the needs of the stakeholders and establish the primary purpose for the assessment before we get into the technical details of reliability, validity, content, etc. That needs to be very clear from the outset. And then, once we've established that, because different stakeholders will have different needs, and if we think of the learner, perhaps they want to know about their current level of understanding and the next steps to, that they need to aim towards. We've got parents and carers who will need some information. We've got teachers who are looking for various um, levels of information. Head teachers, management information, um, authorities and national level. So we need to be really clear about what we are conducting the assessment for in the first place and then um, move from there on to look at the quality and how we might best assess to get the information that we want. Do you want to come? Oh, sorry. Well, <laughs> I, I, I think that we have to start with the idea that the, any, any assessment is a tool and it takes time for professionals to learn to use it and to learn to use it well and to learn what it can do and what it can't do, what you can, can do with it and what you can't do with it. So I think um, the University of Strathclyde staff would want any conversation to be rooted not just in ideological arguments about what stakeholders would like and what they need, but also in, in, in an understanding of where Scottish education and Scottish educators are actually coming from in terms of their current data use and how that's, how that's, how that's currently seen. For us, I think we would argue very strongly that you do need some, some um, good standardised data but you also need a really robust set of ethics around that to highlight to teachers, local authorities, inspectors, parents, the media and politicians what you can do with that data and what you can't do with that data. If you've got a good ethics policy around it, you would actually be educating teachers to use the data well and you would be creating a system that actually worked for the children of Scotland. Um, yeah, Ms. Shaw. Thanks, Convener. I, I think the criteria has to be based on what will make learning better and what will make teaching better, and any information that helps to inform teachers and, and indeed uh, young people and children, as well as their parents, of the progress that they're making against national benchmarks, if you like, or. or uh, or any other sort of um, curricular element that would measure that progress, that's essentially what it has to bring about. And that in itself will raise attainment. And uh, eventually, I, th I think Professor Sue Ellis is right, there needs to be a right sense uh, or, or real ethics around it and about how we use it. And I think we all have responsibilities in how we do that, including parents uh, and schools and local authorities and the media. But essentially, it has to be about improving the experiences of young children uh, and uh, young people and making sure that they reach their potential. That, that has to be borne out in terms of the criteria. In terms of whether I think the data is getting better, yes, I do. I, I think the publication of CFE teacher judgments is improving. I know that it is still experimental data, but the SNSAs will help to moderate those teacher judgments, as well as other activities that we will take about to make sure that there is dialogue and professional dialogue around uh, those teacher judgments. And that will be, uh, as Sue says, one tool of assessment, not the be all and end all, but certainly one that teachers will be able to use to measure their progress and their judgments about whether they're on the same page as their colleagues. So I, I think criteria around those sorts of aspects would, would make it most useful for the whole system. Thank you. Professor Mendelos. Um, I suppose um, the, the focus of your question was about assuring the community the quality of the, of the assessment. 
and in that respect, I think the quality of the instrument itself, the assessment instrument, is fundamental, and we take a, a lot of trouble and pain and expertise to ensure that the instruments are, are sound, robust, valid from a number of different perspectives. Um, and that includes ensuring that we consult very carefully and widely with people in the education community, the stakeholders, to make sure that what we're assessing is what's important. So if we're going to measure something, we need to know that it's what we intend to measure. And we ensure that by getting qualitative feedback from stakeholders, learners, teachers, People Education Scotland and the Scottish Government, for instance. Um, but also we have um, statistical tools to ensure that the, that the assessments are um, <clears throat> measuring something coherent that has meaning, that it's not just a random um, form-filling exercise. So we've, we've got a, a lot of uh, quality assurance measures in place and <coughs> we've tried to um, make it transparent to the public how, how those are <coughs> excuse me, implemented. Um, as a number of the submissions, including my own, stated, no matter how good the assessment is, if the results of it are not used and not understood, it's pointless. And the reporting, of course, is a very key element in that. And the clarity, the transparency, the accessibility of the reports is something that we've worked very hard with the Scottish Government to, to try to ensure. So there are different levels of reporting. Um, fundamentally, the, the school level reports are designed for teachers to give them information about individual pupil performance. Um, there are also uh, school level reports that aggregate some of the data into, in a way that we hope is transparent and useful for schools. And there are local authority reports that have a wider aggregate, aggregative purpose, but also give a lot of detail to local authorities so that they can analyse the results in their own ways with support. And finally, the third key element in making um, an assessment uh, valid and useful and quality assured is ensuring that there's a good mechanism for providing professional learning to schools, teachers, local authorities, to make sure that they are able to interpret the results um, with information, with clarity, with intelligence and with effect, so that uh, the training program that has been implemented alongside the implementation of the assessment itself from the beginning as part of our contract, uh, which Scholar uh, from Harriet Watt is running, is an absolutely key element and a really unusual, I think, in internationally an unusual element in a, a national program, that there was the foresight to bring along a, a professional development and training program with the inception of, of an assessment, a national assessment, to ensure that it is used in a way that's intended. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My second question, uh, before other colleagues will uh, go into specific details, really has two parts to it. Do any of you feel that there is a set of data that we don't currently have that would be helpful in informing uh, the whole process of assessment? But the second part, and perhaps um, Professor Ellis, if you could, I was very interested in what you said about uh, a, a, an ethical um, sort of strand to all of this. Is it your view that the interpretation of the results uh, that we have currently are not being effectively used in terms of giving us the right results of what it is we're trying to do, in, in other words, raise attainment. It, could you just expand on what you feel about that? Sometimes, when I, I'm in and out of local authorities and schools a lot, and I talk to teachers, I talk to um, head teachers, to um, local authority improvement officers, and to directors of education. And there is an emerging um, amount of research that actually looks at the idea that, that actually it's not that the variability in the progression pathways of of children is so variability that is so variable that actually it's not appropriate to use any one-off standardized assessment for target setting for tracking for whole scale interventions. So there are examples in Scotland where local authorities will test all the children in the local authority at a particular point in time and then put the bottom 20% automatically into a fairly rigid and um, inappropriate for some um, set of, of, of work. And um, they are using it sometimes for streaming and setting. Now that's not just to do with standardized uh, data that they're getting. Some 
schools, local authorities are doing it with the formative data they're getting through from nurseries. So some of the work that I do, I go into um, schools and where schools, for example, might have a two-form entry. I will look at whatever data the school's got, and it might be book-level data, it might be standardised data, but I will see a difference between the two classes, and the heads will explain, well, of course, we set on entry to primary one, <laughs> and we set on the basis of the formative data we're getting through from nurseries. Now, when I explain to them how that enshrines disadvantage and how it's not an ethical use of data, they very often change their policy. Sometimes when you talk to their directors of education, I mean, two directors of education I can think of have um, just sent emails around to schools saying that they are not to do this. But um, I think that there is a very poor understanding at the moment in terms of the research on how reliable and predictable how, how, how an assessment score can predict results. So the research I'm looking at at the moment is, is the research by Becky Allen at, when she was in, at the Education Data Lab, where only 9% of children actually followed the, um, the projected pathway from their first standardised assessment to their fourth one, 91% either overshot or undershot. Now, if you've got that much variability in the system, at any point, if somebody comes in and says, right, we're going to group these kids on the basis of a single assessment score, that's unethical because you're going to get that amount of variability anyway. So I think there will be, in learning to use standardised assessment well, we will need a really big much mind shift, professional shift in terms of how, how staff think about assessment and how they use assessment. It's probably the sort of shift that isn't helped by high level ideological debates. It's probably the sort of shift that needs to be made in terms of how, um, how you actually respond to the data that you get. I think you see similar ethical difficulties when um, the media look at um, data from schools and try and pitch one school against another because very often in primary school your actual sample size isn't big enough to be able to make those sorts of, 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 of judgments and so I suppose what I would argue for is a very grounded view of, 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 of standardised assessment. One thing, um, would you equate um, unethical with misuse? Is that, yeah. is that what you're saying? I, I think that right. some of the ways that I see um, the sort of standardised tests that have been going on, and, and non-standardised tests, I mean, local authority devised tests, um, some of the uses that I see happening in schools at the moment are not ethical and I actually see the introduction of a national assessment as an opportunity to open that up for debate and to get a much better use of assessment, one that actually works for children and parents. As um, can I just ask, can, can I just let the other panel members respond and then I'll bring in Russell Mont. If, if anyone does want to respond to that point. That we need, that we don't have, yeah, if uh -huh. anybody's got any points yeah, on that. Um, yeah, I think um, there is a lot. Do, well, you, can I just clarify, were you thinking about what schools need or what you could do with what, the government? Yes, because the schools are the ones who are delivering the uh, assessment. So, yes, is, is there any data that you feel is missing when it comes to good quality um, or, or our ability to produce good quality assessment? Um, I think there are assessments that can be done at different time points to the, to the national assessments and um, I've got examples of schools doing that. So they are collecting information from multiple different sources to inform their practice and um, assessments from the CEM would be one example of that. So I had an example of a teacher in a primary one school from this, this current year who is assessing their children with the CEM assessments at the start of primary one because she wants some information about what those children know, what they can do to inform her practice, and then she's using the standardised national assessments later on in the year to confirm her own judgments now at where the children are, 
Um, and then, you know, so that's a nice blend, I think, of with, both assessments. With, with good results, because, yeah. I mean, that's the key thing. You know, what, what assessment process is giving the best results? That, that's the whole number yeah, of this. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. It's giving the best results. It's not too um, onerous on the child or the teacher as well. Hmm. Um, so that was one oh. nice example. And as you go up through the primary school, um, again, they're using assessments maybe in alternative years to give a bit more information so that you're not waiting more than one year for information coming in. I'd just like to add to um, Professor Ellis's comments about predictions. And one study that we have done is looked at children at the start of school, around 45,000 children, and followed them up to the end of secondary school. Now, that was in England. Um, the correlation between your um, attainment at the start of school and age 16 is 0.5. So as you say, there's a lot of variation in there and children don't follow a linear tra trajectory maybe necessarily. So, you know, you'll have a real um, burst in activity and then you'll have a consolidation phase. So I think it's really important to look at this holistically and not just, um, you know, between two particular time points. It could be that that particular child is consolidating their learning or maybe they've just learnt something new and they're going on from that. So I think that's an interesting study to look at as well and bear in mind. So there is a relationship, but it's not a fixed one set in stone. And that matters when schools then respond to um, data in, in, in ways that are not appropriate. Okay. Um, does anyone else want to come in on those points? No. Um, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Um, yeah. I think one of, one of the um, pieces of information that will be really useful to, to schools and um, the wider education community over time, which is... is initiated now but isn't yet in force is the uh, the mapping of progress over time which um, the methodology that is being used for the SNSA allows to happen in a quite transparent way because there's a, a long a long scale which has been implemented in this year's assessment it wasn't available in the first year which will allow tracking over time of pupils as they go through the years of schooling from primary one through to secondary three in each of the subject areas um, and also allow equating over time at, at a year group. So primary four, for instance, a school can look at how primary four results this year compare with last year, with next year, and so on. Um, and the methodology that we're, we're implementing in the SNSA allows that to happen. So I think that's an area of data that is going to be improved and is, and is already um, instigated. Um, I suppose another, another area that I think is an important one that could be developed alongside or within the SNSA is... Um, qualitative sort of explanatory information that about how children um, engage with their learning, their attitudes to learning, their school atmosphere and so on. There, there isn't currently uh, any instrument or uh, survey mechanism in the SNSA, alongside the NSA, that captures that kind of information. And I think uh, ways of managing that can, could be integrated with the SNSA. And I think that would be really helpful in trying to work out why things are happening the way they are. So, okay, Miss Want? Yes, just really specifically on this question of whether something is ethical or not. If it's not ethical to get information about a child and then decide how you're then going to support the child or, or presume how that child might be supported in terms of what work they would get, why would it be ethical to make judgments about an individual or a school against national benchmarks? I'm not. Are you saying that the only way we should use the data is to support the individual child, but we can't make any presumptions or assumptions about the child's learning from it because it then maybe locks them into a particular form of support? Or it, we're making judgments about an individual against... I mean, we heard from our colleague here that, in fact, you would judge the school or the individual against national benchmarks, and this is seen as a way of, of um, pushing up attainment. I wonder what... Where does the ethical, th where does that balance lie? Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, the, the any assessment, any short assessment can only give you a snapshot of where that child is at that one period in time. If you then take that snapshot and use it to make systemic changes to how that child is educated, so you put them into a bottom set or you um, put them into a, a catch-up learning group, from which they find it difficult to escape, then that's... About, it's not about the support, it's about 
what then happens? It's you can't move from it, you yeah. can't progress the, the, from it. Probably the school that I've seen um, making the best um, use is um, a school in Limwood, Woodlands Primary. And one of they, they make hard use of assessment data <laughs> to have hard conversations with staff, but completely keep the children as part of a class, as part of a learning community, where they are talking to, uh, they are that they recognise that that learning isn't just about the program you provide the child with; it's actually about the whole environment that, that the child is is in. So, um, and I think that when you look at how some of the data is being used, formative and and um, standard, standardised um, data is being used at the moment, is it is sometimes being schools are overplaying their hand. Now, it may be that they're assuming, and they're not doing it because they want to be bad, they're just doing it because they, they haven't they haven't realised that actually the data doesn't have the predictability the predictive would that not be true of standardised assessments as well though? it's true of everything yeah so it what, so, what so it is a snapshot a and we shouldn't, pre we shouldn't presume of... from it what a child how a child should be supported we shouldn't assume there'd be predictability about it mm. can you explain then why it would be given such a priority in terms of education policy at a scottish level if it neither predicts nor determines predicts a child's abilities in the future or determines the support they should have? Because it gives useful information to schools and local authorities about how individual um, children are getting on. It could be very useful for a class teacher. I, I think you've got two very different um, ideas about about, about um, what the assessment is, is, is good for. One of the things about Curriculum for Excellence is that it is a... Um, complex <coughs> curriculum with with many layers and very responsive and the emphasis in curriculum for excellence is very much on teachers getting the right learning mix for children now that's different from 5 to 14 which was a much more rigid curriculum and kids progressed through the curriculum at different rates but you didn't really change a huge amount you perhaps made tasks a wee bit easier or a wee bit harder but you didn't actually change the learning. It was very difficult in curriculum in, in 5 to 14 to change the learning mix. Curriculum for Excellence is premised on the idea that the learning mix really matters. And to work out that you're... And, and so you do need points where you actually check that we're getting the right learning mix and that the learning mix... And, and know who it is the learning mix is, is, is serving well and who's not being served well so by the So the standardised assessment is... Diff is not then just a snapshot it is defined it's showing us whether an individual child is getting the learning mix is that what it's for it that it can it can act as a as a as, a, as an opportunity to reflect on that it can be quite diagnostic and i think i mean what we don't know the the um, data on on the predictivity of of assessments is very much based on english data it may be that because the um Scottish assessments are many, in, in many ways broader and they are better linked that we, that they, they do have a better predictive capacity, but you'd need to have, you'll need to be using them for about 12 years or 15 years to work that out. <laughs> so until that point, the ethical position has to be do no harm. <laughs> and, um, don't, so you don't set, you don't stream, you don't put children into catch-up um, programs that are not that remove them from the main body of the class and and put them in a different category from other children on the basis of of, of one of one snapshot. Thank. You. With permission, can we just ask a very specific question about the process around standardised assessment, and then I'll um, let my colleagues ask their questions. We were told that the test, I mean, in the briefing we were given by Scottish Government officials around how the test would be run, it could be done at any point in a child's primary one, we'll talk about primary one rather than further up, so any time between the age of four and a half and six. So to what extent, if there's that range, can that be a standardised assessment given the gap in probable capability between a four and a half year old and a six year old? And the second thing we were told is an actual running of the test, so it's a multiple choice, you can answer A, B, C. Does this word sound like this word? Which word sounds the same as that word? And there's a little button 
and you can press that to hear the words so you hear the answer being said. And I asked the question, would there be any distinction in the assessment that was given to the teacher or whomsoever between a child who needs to press a wee button to hear the words and those who didn't? And I was told there would be no distinction between those two. Would you not think that a child who was able to go through that whole process without having to hear the words said to them, but could read it and hear it themselves, that would at least be reflected in the test. So in the question of age range, and in this question, actual functionality, how much more information we're getting than a teacher might get in, through working with a child in the class? Well, yeah. uh, can I ask that question? Yeah. Um, the the standardisation of the assessment resides in the fact that uh, there's a, a single pool of items, questions, that are administered to from which an assessment is selected for each child taking the assessment in the year groups that have been identified. And as you know, it's an adaptive assessment. So that means that depending on how the child is performing in the assessment as they go along, they will get more difficult questions or easier questions depending on the capacity they've shown. So that it's pitched um, at an appropriate level for the child to get maximum information about what they know and what they don't yet know. <clears throat> so the standardisation is in the pool of items being um, being common to all children in the year group, um, in the fact that the the assessment, uh, the, there are some limitations around the um, the administration of the assessment and, um, and that the results are uh, processed in the same way for all children. Within that, there is some flexibility uh, appropriate for an assessment that is, that is low stakes, so no individual child's future depends on the results there, um, and it takes into account the different uh, equipment that the child might have at their disposal because of the uh, availability of hardware and so on at the school, um, and also the child's way of approaching. So we can't, we don't, there's flexibility in the way children approach an item, depending on uh, what their, their capacity is. Now, there are some items, you mentioned um, whether they hear audio or not. There are some items where the child would, would need to hear the audio in order to answer the question. There are other items where if they can already decode, they don't need the audio support. But if they can't, the they will. Would that assessment that the teacher got reflect that difference? Because I would have thought that was quite a, sim a basic thing. But secondly, this other question about how valid a group is it, if it's a child could be four and a half or a child could be six? Well, and the fact is that the way that Scottish education works, children can enter school at different ages. Um, they, they are, there's, there's an 18. Would it be better to be done by age rather than stage? Well, um, our... Uh, approach to this is that children are in a particular year group and there is a, a curriculum that is um, established for that year group and we're assessing where children are in their stage of learning. As Sue has said, any assessment is only taking a, a measure of a child's capacity at a particular stage. So it, when the teacher receives a report on the child, it has the child's age, in case they didn't know, which they probably will. But I mean, that's one of the factors that they would take into account in, in interpreting the results of the assessment. And as you pointed out, the child can take the assessment at any time in the school year. So it's not standardised in the sense that there's a particular day on which they need to take it. One of the, 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 um, the key elements of this assessment is that the, the children are um, able to take the assessment when the school deems that they're ready to take it. So it's, it's designed to provide information to the teacher about where the child is in their learning, given that there are benchmarks for learning for the stages of schooling in Scotland, and to take into account the, fact, the other factors they know about the child, about their age, um, how they're faring at school, um, their attitude to school and so on, when they interpret the results, as well as other kinds of formative assessment. So they're having to assess whether the child's ready to be assessed before they assess them? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. They have to assess whether the child is ready to be assessed and well, that, I think, understanding includes practice running that kind of test yeah. with a child. Yeah, so the teacher, the teacher we're, we're, um, we're assuming that teachers will take into account when the child is ready to do the assessment. And that doesn't mean when they're going to be un un able to answer all the questions correctly. No, it means when they think the child is emotionally or um, psychologically or, or inter intellectually ready to take the assessment, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Professor Mayor, yeah. Can I just pick up on the standardisation as well? And when we think of a child, um, they learn more through maturation, through their environment, etc., and they also learn at school. And so we have been looking at um, children, the impact of schooling on children at different ages. Now, we've only done this through the primary school, 
but there's a huge amount of learning that takes place in primary one. Children tend to go, they might know a few letters, etc. By the end of primary one, many of them can read quite a lot of words, they can do some comprehension, they can do quite a lot of maths. As you go up through the year groups, that amount of progress tends to get less and less and less. And when you get to secondary, it's starting to flatten out. And when you get into adulthood, you're probably on a line and then declining. <laughs> OK, so you've got the age and you've also got the stage within the school year that you need to take account of. So I think it is quite problematic to have a standardisation that um, covers a large stage as well as the age, especially for the young year groups. It's not so problematic when you get older. Top end of primary, secondary, I don't think this is a problem. But we, do ha we have quantified <coughs> that amount of learning that takes place in a school year, and that needs to be accounted for in your standardisation, I think. Okay. Ms Shaw, did you, did you want to come in? On this I, I think that uh, thanks, convener. There, there were a, a few bits and pieces um, related to the ethics and the use of um, assessments, and, and I would emphasise uh, that it is only one piece of assessment, and that is certainly leadership is key in all of this, uh, and that leadership needs to be at all levels, from directorate and especially from head teachers about the ethical use of that data. And it has to be about using that as one point in time, how that child has performed with that assessment in the midst of all other assessment information that a teacher will be using on a daily basis about a child's performance against the, the curriculum and the activities that are set for that child to make progress with the curriculum. Go, going back to an earlier one about um, pupils uh, questionnaire uh, or um, survey about pupil attitudes to learning and so on. Actually, one of the things that was good about the SSLN was that there were both pupil and teacher questionnaires that measured and gave very good information to uh, local authorities and indeed nationally about how uh, confidence levels could be improved um, with particular aspects of the curriculum. And that would be something that I would suggest if we are building that into the SNSE, that uh, we go back and look at that. That was very valuable information and certainly something that we used in East Renfrewshire when we reviewed particular areas of the curriculum. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Ellis. You wanted to come? Um, I, I think the, the part of the difficulty um, is, is that the when you're saying what can teachers do with it you're almost looking at it in terms of a, a summative assessment so when you're saying is to determine whether or not a child has achieved a level and what i found quite interesting about the eis applicate um submission of evidence actually was quite interesting was that they did have this debate about whether it's about confirming teachers assessments or informing teachers assessments and if you're talking about confirming teachers assessments you are almost talking about using the national assessment as a summative tool have they reached the level or not i think that with curriculum for excellence we actually need a shift in that sort of mindset and so we need to get teachers looking at how they can use the assessments in a much more diagnostic way. So, and that diagnos diagnosis can be in terms of particular items. So you might have a whole class where the comprehension levels are quite low and that gives a head teacher or the teacher herself opportunity to actually say, well, actually, I've not got the mix right. But you've also got opportunities in the, the, um, the new assessments to actually look across items and actually take quite a diagnostic view. So, for example, there's one item where children have to listen to a story that's read to them and answer comprehension questions on it. And there's another item where they have to read a few sentence, uh, sentences and answer comprehension questions on it. And it can be very easy as a class teacher to have a child who you know isn't really comprehending when they when they read. They can't retell the story at the end of it after they've after they've read they've read it two minutes ago and they still can't remember it and retell it. And as a class teacher, if you have two two children, both of whom do badly on the reading comprehension, but only one of whom does badly on the listening comprehension your actual point of intervention there that is different 
it can be very, very easy in a class of 25 or 30 to miss poor oral story comprehension. And so the opportunity, and when I say that the, 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 the assessments are a tool that teachers need to learn to use well, and they need time and space to learn to use it well, that these are the sorts of uses that we could actually be exploring. I think that there's a lot of um, um, opportunity to provide really good case studies about how these assessment items are being, are being used well and how they're being used ethically with lots and lots of explanations about why that's, why that's good use. I think there's a slight danger in that we do have the, the um, there is a, a sort of a, a, a common um, a strand going all the way up where you can actually um, look at that and there's a danger that schools will look at that and think that that is a predictive measure and so I think there needs to be a lot of education around that but teachers, of Scotland, teachers in Scotland want to do their best for the, for the children that they care for and so giving them opportunities to actually explore that is important. I think if you look across at the different views of assessment in all these submissions that you've had to this committee, you'll actually find teachers thinking about assessment in very, very different ways. Okay, Mr. Gray. Thanks very much. Um, I, I had a couple of specific questions for, for Julia about the design of the SNSA. Um, but I wanted to start with something that Christine said. You said, Christine, that the most important thing in design and assessment was to have the primary purpose clear from the outset. Um, and that has been part of the debate around SNSA. Uh, are these tests designed primarily to provide uh, information which teachers can use diagnostically in their learning strategies with pupils? Or are they a way of measuring standards in schools and progress in the attainment gap? And so my question to Julia is, in designing SNSA, were you clear what the primary purpose was and what was it? I guess I would answer that by saying that there are dual purposes. So a single primary purpose is not, not something that I think we've subscribed to. Um, so there isn't a primary purpose? Well, that's not to say that there's no purpose. There are two really important purposes. No, no, but Christine's point was the most important thing is establishing the primary purpose. You're saying in designing these, you didn't know what the primary purpose was. No, I didn't say that. I, I said that um, there, there, were more, there was more than one very important purpose. One of the purposes, a, a very important purpose, was to give teachers good information about where children are in their stage of learning that would allow them to um, reflect on where, where the children are, whether it was whether it was whether they were finding out something new about the children and to help them to take the next steps, whether they're, whether they're showing um, some challenges in their pro state of learning or whether they are, they are going great guns going ahead so that there's something to be done children to help as, them to as, as individuals, you mean? Yes, yeah. as individuals. And there's also class level information so that you can look at where children are performing as a group perhaps very well or not so well that you might take action to, to support. So that's, that's one really important purpose. Another important purpose is to um, help the, the Scottish Government and the t education community to uh, Im both improve the overall um, capacity of children in literacy and numeracy and to close the attainment gap. And in order to get, have information about what the gap is and whether it's being widened or, or narrowed, one needs some national level data, as well as data at the individual school level. So both of those purposes are very important, um, prime purposes for the assessment. And I think in the way that the assessment's been designed and reported, we are working towards meeting those goals. So when the, the, the first uh, report on SNSA was published back in December, ACR were quoted as saying that the national level results had to be treated with caution. Um, and I think that was because um, the tests were taking place at different, different times in the year in, in different areas. So I wonder if you could enlarge on that. It says, results from all, this is a quote in that report, result from ACR, results from all learners should be interpreted with some caution when making any comparative judgments. 
So I wonder if you could elaborate, because you said one of the purposes was that national um, yes. monitoring, but that, that, that seemed to imply, the report seemed to imply that that only really worked if, I guess, all the pupils took the, all the children took the test at the same time, which they don't. I, th I think uh, the, the quotation that you've just read out was referring to um, the interpretation of results of smaller groups, of so individual children or, or class groups or school groups or even local authority groups, to take into account when the assessments were administered to the children when they were interpreting results against the national norms. The norms were, were administered at a, the norming study was conducted at two particular points in time, in November 2017 and March 2018. And there was a scientifically drawn random sample of pupils across Scotland, which was stratified, so it took into account um, the uh, local authorities, gender, um, uh, two other factors, two other variables were taken into account in drawing the sample. So we're confident that, that the um, measures of children's performance from those two normal studies are robust and reliable. So the, what was pointed out in that, that report was that when you're looking at children, smaller groups of children's results at the school level or whatever, in relation to the national norms, you need to take into account when the assessment was done. So we, we, we have achieved in this, that very first year of implementation robust national standards across the country that were are scientifically uh, defensible. But, but, the, but those are norms, those are benchmarks. So if you then, in future years, compare results against those benchmarks, but those results come from tests which have been taken at different times, that... Yes, they may... They, yes, so, so there's a flexibility in the, in the design of the programme for, as we've mentioned before, for children to be administered the assessments at a time when the school judges that to be appropriate. But when interpreting the results of the child's performance, they need to take into account the point at which the child was administered the assessment when they're, if they're looking at the, the national norms um, for points of comparison. That's, so both things are true. You, 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 you need to be cautious in making comparisons, but there is a, a set of statistics that allows you to look at what's happening nationally. But I'm asking really about the year-on-year -year comparisons of the performance of the system. Does, does that not imply that, that that has to be treated cautiously? Well, so if we um, look at one year and then we look at another year and say there's been an improvement or the attainment gap's closed, that would be affected surely by when the children took the tests. That's true, and that's okay. in the first year as well as in subsequent years. But what we're recommending to the Scottish Government, and I think they're um, also enthusiastic about this idea, is that national norming studies are conducted regularly, perhaps every couple of years, so that, so that we can track um, how the nation is performing over time. Okay. Um, can, can I ask a slightly different question in terms of the design? Surely. Sure, I want to spin on that point. I, I, I just wanted to exemplify a wee bit further that the purpose of the SNSEs is either to confirm or verify or moderate a teacher's assessments. Then primacy then has, is, has in terms of me measuring performance and measuring progress and whether the country is improving would be those teacher judgments, not necessarily the SNAC. Okay. I get, I get that, yep. Um, so, in the submission from ACR about the design of the test, you say um, that uh, when the tests were being designed from the pool of questions, that uh, these were reviewed and critiqued by panels of experts from Education Scotland and the Scottish Government, um, and that uh, later on um, those panels were consulted again I just wanted to ask what the involvement of teachers was uh, in this. That says experts from Education Scotland and the Scottish Government. Yeah. I just wondered what the involvement of practising teachers was in yeah. the design. Um, there was a little involvement. I wouldn't say there was a great deal. We did some piloting in February 2017 um, in schools and we in invited teachers to give feedback on the assessments as they saw them. So we took that into account in, in going further with the assessments. Um, the, the, the representatives from Education Scotland that were nominated by Education Scotland are people who, are com who come from schools originally. So in that sense, teachers were consulted, although not teachers working in the classroom at that point. Um, I might add that um, we, have, we are implementing at the moment a, a questionnaire for teachers, which will be um, distributed widely 
in February um, to ask them about their responses to the to the SNSA on several dimensions. It's ease of administration, the usefulness of the reports, the the um, behaviour of the children and their, their attitude to the assessment and so on. So we'll be, we are gathering systematic data from teachers um, during the current year. But they weren't involved in the... Practising teachers weren't involved in the design of the tests, though, um, well, initially. Well, insofar as we were, we were given a brief in the contract, I don't know sure. how much teacher input there was yeah. at that end, um, but during the development of the instrument, there was only a small amount of um, direct teacher consultation. OK, thanks. M uh, Mr Scott? Thank you, Kavir. Um, can I just try and understand what you've been saying to Ian Gray there about these norms? So, um, please don't let me try and interpret what you've said. Uh, so, a norm is a benchmark, and are you suggesting that these norms on testings that are going to be done now, on the tests that are now going to be done every two years, I think you suggested to, to Mr Gray, would be the way in which the government or policymakers would assess what was happening nationally? That is one way that they can assess what is happening nationally via the SNSA. What's the other way then? But, sorry? What's the other way? Well, as, as um, Mari's pointed out, the ACEL um, collection is the, the primary means of measuring uh, the, whether children are attaining the standards. So which one is it going to be then? Um, I don't think it's dichotomy. I think I'm sorry, I just don't understand what the government's trying to achieve. That's why I think we've all been asking these questions about purpose. Well, so is it about teacher judgment or is it about an uh, the national performance of, of schools? Well, the SNSA is one contribution to the, the overall assessment picture that is taken into account alongside all the other kinds of assessment that teachers are doing daily yeah. in their classroom practice. So I don't think um, opposing those two things against each other is, is the way that we would see the development of the assessment profile. No, but, but you, again, you said that there was a, your proposal to the government for producing, I guess, information to them which allows them to make a national assessment of what's happening in education is, will have to happen every couple of years because, Ian Gray's point, that schools are not doing these tests at the same time. So the data cannot be perfect and cannot be comparable year on year. Um, at the schools, we're getting information annually from the SNSA and they'll be taking that into account along with the other kinds of assessment they're doing. Um, the way that the SNSA can, can contribute to information at the national level is by conducting norming studies um, at regular intervals to, to track whether the attainment gap is closing, for instance, it's one of the primary um, focuses of Scottish education. But I thought, I mean, from a statistical point of view, from a, an, a, an, and I read ECR's um, view as well, my understanding is that your suggestion to the government when you were first asked to do this work is that these tests should all be done at the same time so as to be able to be compared. Well, if you want to... School year, I mean. Yeah. So they're all yeah. done in May or whatever. Yes. If you want to have a, a, a strict comparison of... Yeah results from one year to the next. And isn't that what the government asked you to do? The, the government asked us to help them to develop an assessment that would allow teachers to understand where children were in yeah. their development of literacy and numeracy. They, one of the, one of the uh, purposes of having a national assessment is that there is consistent data that... that um, Indeed. It's you don't have consistent. to have any doubt about... about um, different instruments being used yeah. or, and so on. Yeah. So there, there's, there are a number of different factors that need to be taken into account in developing a programme such as this. And it has a lot of really wonderful features. From, our, from ACR's point of view, I mean, our mission is to improve learning. We're a not-for-profit organisation and we're, we're re really keen to promote programmes that, that, that honour teacher judgement, that um, uh, respect that teachers are in the best position to make decisions about the individual child's learning in the school, mm. programmes that combine that with being able to generate some useful uh, larger scale data sets that can be used to, to work out whether things are, uh, are working well and where there might be needs to, to reflect on what's not Indeed. going so well. I think that's all entirely fair. I'm just yeah. trying to establish whether you think that's best achieved if these tests are all taken at the same time during the course of the school year. Well, one of, one of those aims might be best achieved if you, if you want to have very strict comparisons between where, how, how a child is going from one year to the next, then taking a measure at the same time in every year, and this goes for large groups too, mm. is important. And mm. that's why we put in that caveat to the national report about yeah. the, the caution that must be taken when making comparisons. Yeah. That doesn't mean that no comparisons can be made. It means that people have to, have to uh, reflect on and, and, and 
appreciate the results that are coming out in a, in a nuanced and intelligent way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's entirely fair. But, but um, you sought to achieve uh, that consistency of data. I guess that was the whole purpose of the, of the work you've been trying to do for the government in establishing this test testing regime across Scotland. So is it, is it fair for me to assume, therefore, that your preferred uh, consistency of data approach would be to have the test done at the same time? For if, that were, if that were the sole purpose of the, um, of the program, yes. But I think given that there are other purposes which are at, at least as important, okay. namely providing some formative information to schools um, and to teachers, individual learners, of the kind that, that um, Sue's outlined, yeah. then I think having um, combining those desiderata is, yeah. is uh, the way that we've moved forward. Okay, that's fine. So there are, uh, therefore, a, a number of other purposes to the to standard tests. Yes, as I've tried to um, answer Ian's question, that there's not a, one single purpose that, that um, supersedes all the others. We're, we're looking for an assessment program that, that yeah. combines the best features yeah. that, that will serve a number that, of purposes. That's very helpful. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my show as a director of education, you were very clear at the outset to Liz Smith that there was one purpose, and that was that. I mean, again, don't let me misinterpret what you said, but, but uh, you said very clearly to Liz Smith that there was one purpose, and that was to assist teacher judgment on the learner, on the journey the pupil was taking. Is that am I fair in uh, saying that? I think that is the primacy purpose, yeah. and I think that would bring about that that improvement in learning and teaching uh, has to generate data that can be used at many different levels. Mm -hmm. So it could be used at individual teacher level, individual pupil level, but can also be used at whole school and local authority and indeed national level so that you are putting the right supports in to help improve mm -hmm. those learners' experiences. Mm -hmm. So yes. I, I, I'm not sure, uh, and it's about the multiple use of um, the same data, mm -hmm. essentially, in, in any Renfrewshire, we have, we are very experienced at using that. Not that Sue always agrees with what we do in East Renfrewshire, but I think our results certainly stand for okay. themselves. And do, do your uh, schools test in May? Uh, our schools, in terms of the SNSAs, mm. have a six-week window to yeah. test. Mm -hmm. um, we continue to use our own standardised assessments to bridge the gap between those being uh, sort of tailing off and the SNAs becoming more robust. Uh, in terms of the information that it gives us okay. at the moment. And do you, sorry, just, is that a transitional measure? Then? Yes, okay. yes. Uh, and do you, do you, and when, now these t tests are in place, what are they going to add, particularly at primary one, to information that teachers didn't already have? Well, in, what, in terms of... Um, they do give that measure against a national benchmark and therefore teachers can look at it and say children are performing well or not or they are performing as I expect them to perform given their performance in classroom uh, against those particular judgments. Uh, in primary one, we do something very similar to what Christine uh, outlined where we do use uh, a, a baseline information on the entry to uh, primary school uh, and then the SNAs would come along later in the school year mm -hmm. once uh, children or once teachers uh, expect that children are ready to take those assessments against the national benchmarks. And I think, yes, you would expect teachers to be looking at the, the curricular advice that they have and thinking mm. how are children performing against that and therefore, I mean, they're not there. And I think there is still a bit of confusion around whether, uh, in terms of what used to happen with 5 to 14 national assessments, those were taken when teachers deemed a child to have completed the assessment. These don't have to be, the SNAs don't have to be. But within that six-week window, it, it does. And we do do them in May, uh, uh, along with, I think, the majority of mm. the rest of the mm. country. Mm. Uh, which does help with those norming, uh, norming exercises as well. Mm -hmm. But I, I would point out that in your papers, it quite clearly indicates that the EIS was instrumental in taking that um, opportunity uh, for um, those sort of, to make them more high stakes, if you like, if everyone was taking them at the same time. I wouldn't want, um, I, I'm sure that parents wouldn't want them either. We don't want to end up with children having tutorials uh, and leading up in the way that they do have in England. Um, and, and therefore, teacher judgment should be primary, mm -hmm. uh, primary in all of this and making sure that this helps to and, and moderate. I, I agree, but you don't think that's a danger simply because of uh, 
uh, the pressure now to, to close the attainment gap and all the national things that are being said by, by education secretaries and so on and so forth, you don't think that's inevitably what's going to happen? The pressure is going to come on schools at all levels, from P1 up, to make sure these things are all done at the same time, that therefore national results can be produced and therefore the, the things can be said nationally about what's happening in Scottish education? But, but the, the curriculum for excellence teacher judgments are gathered at the same time. Hmm. Uh, and, and therefore, the timing of the SNA says are important to be able to inform those teacher judgments which are gathered nationally. Mm. So, no, I, I think that goes back to Sue's point about the ethics of all mm. of it. We have to be, and my point about leadership, mm. and everyone has responsibilities in terms of uh, leading and making sure that this data is used appropriately mm. when it is robust enough to be used mm. appropriately. Mm. Uh, and uh, I have to say that I have spoken to class teachers who um, have used the raw data. So they will go in and look at how children have performed against particular skills or particular questions in the SS uh, SNSE. Uh, and it has made them question uh, or indeed have dialogue about pupil progress, either confirming or, or indeed suggesting that children are making more progress more quickly or slowly than they would have expected from. But it is just from classwork, but mm -hmm. it is just one piece of information and we would never say that it's the only piece of information. It has to be in the mix of everything else. And in that sort of sense, the EIS was right to make sure that it doesn't, because if you do go down that road, it does become high stakes. You're kind of saying we should stop obsessing about standard tests, aren't you? I, I think I, I think my advice to you would be that the profession uh, has welcomed them from, from the uh, so, professionals. Some of the profession has welcomed them. Well, a lot of the profession, sure. and certainly in East Renfrewshire, uh, if I can speak about that, the they EIS have. They, yeah. they, they have welcomed them. But um, I think the EIS's agenda is slightly different, but I think you would need mm. to ask them about mm. that. We, we are, don't worry. Uh, yeah. And... Uh, uh, but the, uh, you know, I do think that five to fourteen assessments were um, always rubbished as not being yep. uh, robust enough. Then, when they were taken away, uh, everybody thought they were the best <coughs> things since sliced bread because at least they gave some sort of information. Which is why a lot of, and that's what's in the ADSE submission. That's why a lot of people went into standardised assessments and used uh, the Durham approach. But. Um, this is bringing back that opportunity for people to measure their own children's progress against what are national benchmarks and assessments that are taken okay. on a national basis. Can I ask Professor Ellis one question, and I don't want you to, to go on about uh, uh, East Renfrewshire. We, we, that's not the... Sir Ellis has wanted to come in on, on a couple Indeed. of points so I'm already. Indeed, so if you can answer the question, before she answers the question, I don't want her yeah. to ask. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, it was actually in response to Joanne Lamont because, uh, and again, please, if I've got you wrong here, do correct me. But I think you said um, something along the lines that we would need 12 to 15 years of data before we could fully understand what was happening. Now, I can't exactly remember the context of the answer you gave to Joanne Lamont earlier on, but that strikes me as one heck of a long time to find out what's happening. Please, uh, maybe, maybe not that long, but you'd need data for children uh, for children to move all the way through the school yeah. system before you yeah. saw how um, an whether or not a, 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 a a score that they got in primary mm -hmm. one was um, determining what university degree they got. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so we'll I think that's an issue. I yeah. think probably the, the point that I want to make is any assessment, if you're spending taxpayers' money on it, has to be useful. And has, so in, in, term, in this, it has to make an impact. Um, I've worked in Scotland for a long time, 30 years, and um, the SSLN... The only people, every, the, I mean, as you know, the last few results have, have, have gone down. The only people I heard talking about that were politicians and the odd academic. I didn't hear directors of education saying, we're going to go back and look at our system because obviously, you know, something that we're doing, we're going to reassess our teaching. I didn't hear class teachers talking in that way. I didn't hear head teachers talking in that way. So you need to have, if, 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 if you want something that actually works and 
um, benefits the children of Scotland, you do need something that actually has some sort of purchase with the practitioners who can actually make a difference. So it has to really, really speak to the teaching and learning that goes on in classrooms to how teachers think about the, the, the children sitting in front of them. And that, again, is, is it, none of this is going to be perfect. <laughs> It has to be good enough, and you have to interpret those results in terms of being good enough rather than a truth. There are lots of different sorts of truths. That's a Donald Rumsfeld, if ever I had one. <laughs> but, uh, thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Greer, who would you like to come um, Just before I move on to a slightly different question, a couple of supplementaries on some interesting points that were brought up so far. Just to start, um, so you'd mentioned uh, it was, uh, Woodlands Primary in Linwood that you'd mentioned as a, an interesting example. My understanding of what you said there was that uh, they're using the results to have, I think you described it as, as hard conversations with teachers, but they're not jumping straight into um, ability set groups or anything like that. Just to clarify, is that hard conversations about the needs of the individual children or are there conversations being had with the teachers? Are judgments being made on teachers based on the results of their class results? No, hard conversations with teachers about the children they're teaching and what those children need. So, um, because you, you wouldn't have in any one data set for a primary classroom enough data to say whether a teacher was doing a good job or not. I mean, it's just not a, it's not a robust sample. So, um, but what the head will do is she will actually sit down and actually say, you know, well, how does this child feel about their, their reading? What sorts of things are they enjoying reading? What are they finding difficult? What are you noticing about that? Can we have a bit more information about this? What can we introduce them to? Who are their friends? What are their friends doing? Can we network them all? So it's it's a very, very inclusive um, um, approach. We've actually done a very small study um, in Renfrewshire that looks at um, really, really hard to teach um, children. Um, children who really, the school system is not serving well at the moment. Um, and what we've found is that the children who are making the most progress, and it is a very, very small case study approach that we've been adopting, but children who made the most progress were the children where at school system level, the health and well-being data about how the child felt about school and how they felt about themselves as a learner was integrated in, prof in professional conversations with their literacy um, um, data. And when you bring those two things together, I mean, it's, it's not rocket science in a way. If a child's happy, they're going to learn better. <laughs> but when you get those conversations actively being integrated at, at school level by the, by the head teacher, you actually get children who both are more relaxed and happier in school, and they, they learn more effectively as well. So, um, yeah, <laughs> so the hard conversations are very, very specific conversations about how the child feels in their class, what opportunities they're getting in their class, and how those opportunities can be maximised. Thanks. Can I just um, open up this question a little bit about the, the class level data then? Um, completely take your point that um, <laughs> the results of the SNS on their own would not constitute enough evidence to start making judgments on a teacher's ability or, or performance. Should class level, uh, level results ever be used as part of a wider judgment of a teacher's performance? That's a, a concern that's been raised by a number of teachers. They're, they're concerned that this data will be used by management or by the local authority to read into their performance? Should it ever be used as a, a contributing factor? No, I, I don't think there's any, um, I don't think there's a robust research base for saying that. Uh, and if, if, in fact, if you look at the BIRA, British Education Research Association, they've actually um, just recently done a, published a, a publication on bench line um, um, assessments and um, have made the points about how it's actually a very unrobust way to do it, as does the um, academic papers published by Becky Allen from Education Data Lab. Hi, um, I think that um, other means of finding out about a teacher's performance would indicate, 
the assessment results would be a, a reflection of other pieces of information that you've already got. There would be classroom observations, there would be a whole host of indicators in a school that a teacher wasn't um, bringing the best out of their children. And so rather than use the results as the, um, the motivation to investigate the teacher's performance, all it should be doing really is reflecting what you already know about that teacher. If you use them as the motivation, then you bring in all of the risks of those data, you know, the children being coached, whatever other risks might happen, because the teachers are fearful that that's what the primary purpose of those data are going to be. And just to, to move a couple of steps up uh, again, which the, the kind of substantial question that I had around use of this data at a, at a local authority level. So I, th I understand, I think we broadly understand what the purpose would be in using it at, at class level with an individual pupil at a school level. Uh, Mary, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on what, is, what are local authorities using this data for? I don't think we're using it for anything yet. I mean, certainly not in East Renfrewshire. I mean, I would get results on um, how well children are doing. Uh, one of the things that we have developed, in, and, and indeed I think we are speaking to ACER about, is about getting the information. So we have a, a tracking database within East Renfrewshire that tracks all individual children with lots of information in there, not just about standardised assessments but also about teacher judgments and so on. And we want the SNSA information to go in there as well. And then we can use that and cut that in lots of different ways to have conversations. And essentially, that's all it's about. It's about asking questions through the analysis of the data that it generates. But what you would be able to do is to look at it if there were particular components, for instance, at a school level where you would say, um, well, we are not teaching, say, addition and subtraction particularly well. And if we looked at that as a local authority and said there's an issue with that across the whole authority, then it's incumbent upon us uh, to do something about that and to bring about improvement and to help teachers to improve the learning experiences of youngsters through that sort of data. And that's how it's used formatively uh, and, and that summative information that, that we'll get to be able to do that. And from what you've seen through ADES, is that a consistent approach across the 32, or are you seeing local authorities taking a different approach to this? No, I, I don't think that that... I mean, I think local authorities are, will all be at different stages of development. And in East Renfrewshire, we've used standardised assessments for over 20 years. Uh, and um, that information and that approach, we didn't always get it right. I, I think we're getting it better now. And uh, I do think that we do use it to, to ask the questions. And it's the same as any uh, analysis of data. All it does is point the finger and ask you, you know, if you want to shine your torch on a particular area, how would you bring about improvement? Certainly through regional improvement collaboratives, you would expect that that system leadership or system improvement, there will be sharing a practice in that. So I can't speak for all local authorities. I can speak about what we are doing in the West Partnership in terms of bringing about improvement. I don't want us to take us down that road, though. And uh, in terms of analysis of data. And, and the analysis of data, I think the scholar work that is going on will lead to sort of real... Um, improvement and understanding of how the analysis can take place and what teachers should be extrapolating from the results of their pupils. Um, so that is to be welcomed. Um, but I think we are at different stages in real variability um, with at all levels in the system of our use of data. And uh, so you'd mentioned that you've spent, as you would expect, quite a lot of time in quite a number of schools recently. What's your experience of the, the consistency between local authorities and the approaches they're taking to the data? I think that um, some local authorities are taking slightly different approaches, and, um, but we don't know often what those approaches are. You also have things happening at school level that directs of education don't always know about. So, um, and different sorts of pressures on teachers to do and, and head teachers to do different things. So there's one very popular um, literacy scheme that recommends if children are not doing well in their literacy in primary four, they go and sit in the primary two classroom to learn for their literacy lessons. Now, <laughs> that walk of shame, mm. the daily walk of shame, must do terrible things to how children feel about mm. themselves as, as learners and be positively detrimental to their health and well-being. But... <coughs> 
a director of education wouldn't necessarily know that that's what's happening in their school unless someone like me notices it or HMI call it out. And I think that um, when we're talking about making assessments low stakes, we actually need to be looking quite carefully at the checks and balances within the system. So the asking HMIE when they inspect um, schools, Education Scotland, to when they inspect schools, to actually actively ask parents about um, things like teaching to the test, repeated um, repetitions test. So, so building that in so that you've got a sort of monitoring going on there, looking at how the inspectorate themselves think about data and use data and talk about data, looking at the language that we use. And here's something that, that I think that um, parliamentarians could be really useful about, because very often people talk about um, ability, that, that the data is about the ability of the child. It doesn't just tell you about the attainment on that day for that particular child. It doesn't have any sort of capacity or ability um, implications but but so I think that the language that we use is is really important I think having a, 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 a getting the unions to and and local authorities to have really robust whistleblowing processes so that if teachers feel that they are being pressurized to use data in inappropriate ways that could be something so that there, there are a lot of very practical things that we could do um, that move away from um, assessment debates being simply about sort of ideological differences and actually look at the grounded picture of how they're actually used in Scotland and how we can get them used really, really well, because that's the practical problem that needs, that needs solved. If Scotland started doing that, it would probably be the only nation that I've heard of that has those sorts of checks and balances in, approach, in, in, in place. It's not an impossible thing to do, but it does require quite a hard and quite a collaborative <laughs> debate around that with all stakeholders involved. But it is something that actually would be possible and would really serve the children of Scotland well. Thank you. Thank you. Did anyone else want to comment on Rose's questions? Thank you. Um, uh, Mr Mandel. Thank you, uh, Convener. I kind of want to go back to um, an earlier point really around whether the tests themselves are, are robust enough to, to give that snapshot. I'm, I'm thinking, and I've heard from uh, teachers in my own constituency who are concerned you know, about how, how the tests are actually formatted and whether they work, uh, for example, with, for young people with additional support needs, uh, with dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism, uh, whether things being adaptive, uh, you know, whether that actually works, if people lose interest, whether they've got the fine motor skills uh, to, to actually manoeuvre the mouse, uh, whether the, the difference in time limit uh, for how long it's taking people to complete the test, uh, masks, uh, you know, ma masks, other things that are going on, and whether, going back to Joanne's point, you know, we're actually testing diff diff different uh, skills at the same time in the same questions. Um, do you, you recognise any of those concerns? Um the question about um, accessibility for children with additional support needs is something that's loomed very large in our development of the assessment, and we've put in, uh, we've implemented a lot of affordances in the program to help children who have um, visual impairment or, or um, motor skill um, needs um, to to allow them to do the assessment. And I think we we that was clearly a very high priority in the Scottish government's um, requests. And we have had a lot of workshops and consultations with um, um, accessibility experts in Scotland and, and beyond Scotland too about how to make the assessments accessible uh, for those children. So we've, we've used um, uh, WCAG, a world standard of accessibility double A measure. But do you, do you recognise that in making the tests more accessible, you can actually then end up masking uh, you know, other, other difficulties a child's facing? So by making, making adjustments to the test, mm -hmm. it's making it more difficult for the teacher, particularly if you're looking at P1 uh, and, and when the test has been taken, making it more difficult to pick up some of those uh, nuances. And when, when Professor Ellis was talking before, you know, about the, 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 dif the differences in comprehension or other things by, by allowing more variables and allowing mm -hmm. you know, differences in how the questions are, are answered and other things, does that not make it more difficult for the teacher to to identify well, some of those I, things? I think one answer to that is that at, when, when we make um, 
uh, when we introduce affordances in the assessments to allow children with special additional support needs to take the assessments, we are always conscious of what the key intent of the question is, and we don't adjust the question in such a way as to to um, obliterate what it's trying to measure. Well, I mean, so, I, I, I can't see, having looked at the test, having spoken to teachers, how that can be the case. Because if you're looking at two pictures, you know, and, and we're back to the decoding, for example, you know, a, there is a huge difference in... So, so it, there's a huge difference in listening to a question um, you know, and, and reading a question. Mm -hmm. Those are two completely different things, are they not? And well, is it not possible for them to get, get muddled up? So if the point of the question is to um, know whether a child can hear rhyming words, for instance, then they will have to press the button to hear the word to answer the question, regardless of whether they're, they're a child with additional support needs or not. If, if we can't measure that, um, that skill for a child who, who doesn't have a hearing capacity, then that child won't be able to do that question. So there's some questions that are not available for all children, but on the whole, as far as possible, they are available for all children. What we've, what we've said in our guidance to teachers is give the children the kind of normal classroom support that you would give them to do this assessment. As far as possible, we've made the assessments um, available to children with the children's support needs without teacher support, but if the child has a, an aid assisting them in a normal classroom practice, then that should be available to them. So it's striking a balance between making the assessments available to as many children as possible, to the vast majority of children, and um, preserving the integrity of what the assessments try to measure. And you, th you think you've got that balance right? I think we've, we've done a lot better than many other assessments do. It's not perfect, of course. I mean, the fact that uh, about 95% of the available assessments were taken when I think there were about 10% of children with take with additional support needs in the CMS database suggests that many of the children with additional support needs have been able to take the assessment. And, do you and when the teachers um, receive the reports of that child and um, reflect on it, they will be taking into account what the child's um, additional support needs are. So it's, it's a matter of, again, it's a matter of interpretation and nuance. But it is in theory possible for children with additional support needs, for example, to perform better because of the adaptions within the test? Well, we certainly... Uh, then, 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 then the then, then their ability might, might actually be. Do you think that it's possible that in some cases is, issues that children have are, 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 are masked because yeah. of adaptions that have been made for uh, perhaps even for yeah. other children, yeah. not necessarily for those children uh, themselves? Um, I think the, the kind of... The mantra that I, that I use as a test developer, and that's what well, my background is, test development, um, when making adjustments to items for children with additional support needs, is... Would the adjustments, would the affordances that are being added help a child who doesn't have additional support needs to do better on the assessment? And if it would, then that's not a good affordance. So what we're trying to do is create a, a level playing field so that children with additional support needs can, can approach the item in, in a similar way to what a child without additional support needs would be able to do. Does, does that make sense to you? It, it, does, <laughs> it, it, it does make sense to me, but it doesn't seem to match up with what teachers are saying about the test. because. When you say that in particular, I think even for me, um, you know, I, I would find now as an adult, hearing words that rhyme uh, is actually easier to hear them than it is to, to maybe see them. And if certainly if you can both see and hear them together, then that's going to be, it's going to be easier to identify that they rhyme than just having one option or the other. And I think if you take you know, a, a bright uh, young person, uh, they might well take the opportunity to listen as well as to to read in order to maximise their chance of, you know, of, of getting the question, yes. chance the question right. And I think that, that, that certainly from speaking to teachers, even ones who are very positive mm. about assessments, they, 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 have, you know, they have questions about how, it, how it's actually been uh, configured and road tested and how it compares mm. to, to what's done elsewhere. But I, I'll, I'll leave that there. Um, the other uh, just question I wanted to ask uh, it was just going back to, we've heard about a rapid change um, in early uh, years of primary school, particularly um, in terms of, of, of people's ability um, and how much knowledge they pick up. Does that mean uh, that standardised assessment is more useful um, at some stages uh, than at others? And is it better uh, to let some of those things even out um, before starting to, to, to make judgments? Yep, Professor Meadow. I think Professor Meadow was going to okay. come first. <laughs> 
Okay, I'll go first. Um, I think standardised assessments, as all ages, should be able to give you useful information. Um, what I was saying earlier on was the warning about when you do your standardisation um, is more important in the earlier years when there's that rapid period of change. If you assess children within a period of about, about say, a month, and then you base your standardisation on that, um, and then you compare other children who are assessed at that time of their school year, you're going to get, I think, a more reliable result than um, if you have a standardisation that spans, say, six months of the year. Because then how are you going to control for the amount of learning that the children have done, as well as their increase in maturity through age? Thank you. Um, it, it, was, it was a warning, was that. Um, what it comes back to is the basic point uh, a standardised assessment can give useful information throughout your, your education career. Thank you. My question, I guess, was whether there are less risks in starting, taking your baseline once some of those initial variables have settled down uh, after that period of, of, of rapid change. Because there's some children, uh, because of home circumstances or other things, you know, who, who maybe start off with less knowledge, you know, who, 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 might not be who might not be familiar with particular animals or... You know, might, might not have done a lot of reading at home, but within you know, a year or two years of being at school, some of those things, particularly for more able children, settle down. Uh, Absolutely. Quite, quite, um, that's a reflection and, of their learning, and isn't and, it? And, yeah, and we but, but whether, whether, whether it's useful at all to have a, a, a sort of snapshot of, people's, of, pe of individual people's knowledge before they've really had a chance to, to, to start yeah. their formal learning, I guess, was my question. It comes back to what you want to use the assessment for, doesn't it? And if you want to use it to inform your practice and the way that you're going to tailor your activities towards the um, level of development of that child, a baseline at the start of um, that phase is really helpful in doing that. And um, then, of course, if you are looking at progress from that, you're going to see the progress that they've made during school time. If you leave it too late, um, you're not capturing the amount of progress that they've made. Could I just um, add to that? I, I think I agree with everything Christine said, but um, I think the, your idea of um, suggest, your suggestion that perhaps it would be better to wait until later on when children have uh, they, they can, their, their knowledge, understanding and skills will have evened out a bit. Well, I mean, the data actually doesn't support that view. What we see in our data from the first year of implementation, and it's consistent with what was found in SSLN, is that the gaps the gaps between children's knowledge actually increases over time. Um, not, it doesn't decline. So um, getting but a good measure of where children are early on... But individual can, pupils shift around and there's a huge sure. variation between individual performance in that time. So that's, it's, whether, it's whether, whether something particular of, of interest is happening in that, that period of change for individuals or, you know, or, or is it, does, does it follow enough of a pattern to make that a useful measure? Well, I guess what I'm saying is that overall, looking at aggregates, we see that the gaps in um, skills, understanding, capacity, attainment increase over time. For the individual child, there are different trajectories, many different trajectories of growth. And, and work that ACR has done indicates that there are up to six years of difference in attainment within any one year group. Yeah. Um, and that's just some, that's something that I guess we'd like to minimise to some extent as far as possible, but I think we need to recognise that children are at different stages, they develop in different ways. Can I just add one more point? Yeah, certainly. So, yeah, just, just the last point in um, your line of questioning there is that we don't want to be assessing children on their first day into primary one. That's not what I'm saying. We want to give them a little bit of amount of time to acclimatise to the new school, the new classroom, to settle down in that respect, um, but not wait too long for that to happen. Um, a very quick supplementary, Mr Greer, on you, the additional you, support. It, sh it should be very quick. Just to Juliet, hopefully this is a yes-no question. Uh, are these tests a diagnostic tool for additional support needs? Are they designed to be a diagnostic tool for additional support no, needs? No, they're not. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I move on to Dr Allen? <laughs> you, I think one of the messages for me, without putting words in your mouth, come across loud and clear um, from what's been said so far is that assessment isn't anything new and neither are some of the temptations or risks that others have identified to do with um, problems associated with assessment anything new. But one thing we haven't perhaps talked about so much yet is 
where these assessments fit in with the curriculum for excellence. We've already, or you've already described how it's a multi-layered curriculum we have. It's not a statutory curriculum. But can you say anything about the, the content of, the, of these assessments as it measures up against what we're trying to, to, to teach and to measure in the curriculum for, uh, curriculum for excellence? Can I answer that one? Yes. Um, so the, so the, the brief for the SNSA is literacy and numeracy only. It's not the whole of the curriculum for excellence, which has many other facets. And even in, within literacy and numeracy, there is no attempt to cover every aspect of the curriculum for excellence. I think we, should, we have to be perfectly frank about that, acknowledge that. For instance, I mean, engagement in, in, in reading, um, we can't hope to assess that in the kind of assessment that the SNSA is. Um, so, given that, uh, the benchmarks that were published in, uh, as dra in draft form in June 2016, I think, and then again in a finalised form in August 2017, um, are, the, are the, the, the basis for the development of the, of the framework for the assessments, the blueprint. So we've taken, uh, we've taken, in consultation with Scottish Government Education Scotland, key organisers within each of um, numeracy, reading and writing, and, and shape the assessment around those organisers. And um, every item in the assessment has been aligned with one of the benchmark statements. So they are definitely, it's a Scottish assessment, it's designed for Scotland. Um, as you know, the, the instrument, the, the original items came from an international pool, but they've been reviewed, um, in some cases modified, in other cases items were rejected because they didn't align well with the benchmarks. So the, the assessment does address um, aspects of the curriculum for excellence literacy and numeracy benchmarks, but there's there's no um, attempt to say that it covers every aspect. And of course, it's only one one um, ingredient in in um, teachers' evaluation of how children are coping with the curriculum. So um, it's it's got a particular focus, but it is a, a focus that's matched to the curriculum for excellence. I'd be interested to hear from, from Aris about that. I know that Aris has made a submission around the benchmarks themselves and, uh, and how you think that the, the assessments will, will measure up uh, uh, against those in the future. Is there anything you want to add about that? Or? I mean, certainly um, we take as read what um, ha has just been said in terms of the design of the assessments. They are... Uh, as I understand them, um, measured to or designed to make sure that um, they are they are reflective of the benchmarks and the experiences and outcomes in curriculum for excellence, and therefore teachers can use them to confirm or otherwise their own judgments about children's progress with the curriculum. So. I don't know that I've got very much more to add to, mm -hmm. to, to what Juliet has already said. So would, would your experience be that, um, that uh, as assessments were being developed, that the, the expertise or the, the views of, of teachers themselves was fed into the process when, when they were devised? Is that something that you would be content took place? Yeah, I, I'm ve very content that that took place. There was quite a bit of evidence gathering and um, I... Uh, and it, you know, people within East Renfrewshire, other officers within East Renfrewshire were heavily involved in supporting both ADES and the Scottish Government uh, with their um, brief for um, before the tendering document went out, for instance, for, um, for which ACER won. So uh, I'm very content that we've had input to all of that uh, and continued dialogue indeed around improving uh, where there were aspects and we've found uh, ACER to be very uh, open to that uh, and indeed willing to sort of work with us, listen to it and I think what Julie had said earlier about then taking information from teachers about their feedback on uh, their experiences and youngsters' experience with them I think is to be welcomed. I suppose that leads me to ask in that case whether, whether the panel here, or people on the panel, feel that the assessments we're now talking about, the standardised assessments, are a better fit with Scotland's curriculum for excellence than the kind of assessments that were taking place before. 
I see Professor Ellis nodding her head. I wonder if she has a view or... I, I, I think they are. I, I think that, um, the, um, that they're measuring a broader range of, of skills. I think that um, they are... If, if we get the right sort of ethics debates around them, then we can help teachers, politicians, the media, parents to understand that an assessment score isn't about necessarily ch some children being more able than others. It's simply about the sort of experience they bring. <laughs> and curriculum for excellence is very, very much about working to the needs of, of, of children in a, rich, in a rich and inclusive way. So um, I think that they are better than most of the assessments that I saw happening, both local authority internally devised assessments and, um, and um, published ones. Back in there in East Renfrewshire, we redesigned our own internal uh, standardised assessments to fit with the experience and outcomes as they were published um, quite a number of years ago. What we also do is ask our teachers to make judgments about children's progress so that th that, uh, that judgment can also be benchmarked against the outcomes from those standardised assessments. So we took those steps. So I'm not sure at this point whether uh, SNSAs are giving us any more information other than that ability to look at how they're doing against a national benchmark, if you like. Um, but I can't speak for what used to happen in, uh, I think, around 24 local authorities who used the Durham uh, assessments. I think one of the things is timing, that, 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 that teachers get instant feedback. I, I do think there is, that there's a bit of time that teachers need to get their heads around it. I noticed, I can't remember which submission it was, but one of them said, it gives you a lot of information at a very granular level. Teachers don't have time to look at that. And part of me sits there thinking, well, you know, supposing your doctor said, well, actually, I haven't got time to look at the granular level of your blood tests. Um, <laughs> or, so I think you might not want to look in that deep granular level for every single child. But if my child is, is, is not being well served by the curriculum, I actually do want uh, 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 the teacher to actually have that data that she can go into and actually look at it and interrogate it and think about it in lots of different ways. I think one of the things that, that, that any assessment does is it gets teachers to look at lots of different kinds of data about what progress might mean for individual children. It's not a very linear thing, making progress as a reader. It's working to a broad horizon, and you can. There are lots of different pathways you can you can take to take to that. So um, I think that if, but I, I do think teachers just need that time to to look at it and think about it and 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 learn how to use it well in the context of curriculum for excellence. But I think it's got that potential to do it if there's the professional and political will to let teachers do it. Finally, to pick up on a couple of coded references that, that have been there, or not so coded, but polite, um, about the way that we as politicians talk about these assessments. Um, are there any lessons for the body politic in Scotland as to how we talk about these assessments and how we promote public understanding of what they, of what they are and don't? I don't know. Does anyone want to take that one? <laughs> um, a cross-party, collaborative, um, professional consideration about what, what, what local authorities, schools, teachers, and parent groups, and the media could, how they can work together to design a system that actually makes the system work well for children. Um, I think there are issues about making sure it's not used to, to classify and grade teachers or classify and grade schools because those have negative effects on children. But ultimately, it has to be the thing that Mary started off by saying it's about teaching and learning and it's about empowering teaching and learning. So I would like, I suppose, politicians to talk about more experienced and less experienced children rather than more able and less able. <laughs> um, I would like um, 
uh, perhaps a little bit less, um, a, a little bit more focus on, well, actually, what's, ha what's happening in the system at the moment that isn't particularly perfect and isn't particularly desirable. Um, and to have discussions that are quite grounded in how we make things better rather than this is right, this is wrong, this is good, this is bad. Mr. Scott, very quick supplementary. Yeah, uh, thank you. I mean, I'd like Liverpool to win the league, but we don't get everything we wish for. So, um, uh, can I just quote the uh, just on this very uh, area that Alistair Allen has been rightly asking about? Um, the EIS submission today uh, tells us, to the evidence to us today tells us that um, Scottish government officials, uh, when uh, introducing testing to the educational establish establishment, sorry, terribly pejorative word there, to Scottish education, said, and I quote, the assessments were said to cover at a maximum around one-tenth of the skills and knowledge expected <coughs> at each CFE level in literacy and numeracy. Do you recognise, I mean, I suppose it's maybe a, fair, a better question for, for a director of education. Do you recognise that, that as the reality? So how many tenths does it cover? I, I, I wouldn't be able to answer that. that that's, that, that, that's a, 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 I, don't, I don't work with the, the curriculum. I leave so the curriculum and so on. But, yeah. uh, okay, but let's just, I mean, it's an unfair question about the one tenth. But uh, do you re, do you re, is it fair to say, I mean, the EAS are saying here that uh, this is the point about how important these are, which I think Alistair's been driving at, how important we politicians should take these assessments are. The EAS is saying here, and it rather supports your contention that we're all getting too obsessed by them, that only one tenth of the skills and knowledge a pupil gains at each CFE level comes from these, is helped by these assessments. I, I, I think the point that the EIS is making, though, is that we shouldn't blow this out of all proportion. And my advice earlier is about making sure that the assessments are allowed to be used for their primary purpose, mm -hmm. which is about monitoring the uh, that the, the system is working yeah. well. And yes, yeah. it gives you as politicians information about whether attainment is growing uh, and being uh, a gap being closed. But more importantly is that it should be to inform the professional judgments of teachers. Mm -hmm. And in that sort of sense, what we need to do is to make sure that teachers and we give them confidence that we will allow them to make those judgments and expect them to use that information in a professional way. So if it's measuring, if that 10% are is the most, import, the most important skills which has been put into the design to make sure that you know, those are the key elements that a teacher would want to see children making progress with, then yes, that's enough, I would say. Okay. Uh, um, but. Uh, we all have a responsibility, and I've said that quite often this morning, about making sure that we allow these assessments to, um, for the public at large to have more confidence in the system itself <clears throat> uh, and that teachers are getting it right. And, and, and essentially that takes you back to that primary purpose of mm. um, uh, informing teacher judgments. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, I think that's quite a helpful point for them to make. An assessment will never assess every single aspect of learning against one area of the sure. curriculum. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's a really healthy way to look at it, actually. And also, it might, if you are saying that openly, prevent a narrowing of the curriculum just down to those aspects. Mm. They're important aspects. We can use them to monitor progress. But don't let's um, think it's the be-all and end-all, like you were saying, and let's try and prevent that narrowing down to only learning those things. Professor Mendelovitz? No, I'd just like to go back to um, uh, Alice's question about what you guys could do. Um, I think I would, I would hope that um, Scottish parliamentarians uh, would grow to feel quite proud of this assessment. It's got a lot of features that... Uh, will be admired internationally, and I think uh, um, Scotland should be uh, shouting about what some of its excellent features are. For instance, the way that it values very explicitly values teacher professional judgment in um, combining the results of this assessment with their own judgments um, about children's progress. Uh, the fact that it's an online and adaptive assessment, I don't think that there's any other national assessment yet that is um, that has those features. There are some attempts happening in my own country, for instance, um, but they have not been as, as successful just technically as, as the introduction of this assessment has been 
in Scotland. Um, and the fact that, um, as um, um, a colleague here pointed out before, uh, some, some, some caveats or some questions about the accessibility features. Uh, the fact that the assessment is, has tried to take into account and is designed to be as inclusive as it is, is also a very important feature that I think Scotland should be proud of. So I, I would like you as a committee and your colleagues in the parliament to, to really take pride in what's been achieved so far. Not that there's not room for improvement, there is, but it's, it's um, been quite an achievement so far. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring in Ms. Goldruth. Thank you. You know, good morning to the panel. Um, I'd like to pick up on Alison Allen's point with regard to benchmarking the assessments against uh, curriculum for excellence. And it's a bit of a historical question to start with. Um, Professor Merrill, perhaps you can help with it. Um, were the CEM assessments that were used previously benchmarked against 5 to 14? Uh, we did um, a prediction of your five to 14 level on the basis of the CEM assessment, yeah. but it was um, a percentage prediction rather than a direct link to a CFE level. Okay. And that's an important thing to do because it yeah. was one assessment predicting how you were going to do on another one. We wouldn't give um, a one-to-one -one mapping of that. Right, okay. Um, in terms of the contents as well, we worked with Fife Authority, with teachers and um, with authority staff there mm -hmm. many years ago to make sure that we're aligned to the Scottish curriculum. And the CEM assessments themselves, they happened every year with every stage, is that correct? Uh, they were available for yeah. use every year, but different authorities and different schools chose to use them with different year groups in their class. Yeah. The, the reason I ask, obviously, is because I'm a Fife MSP and um, you might be aware that Fife voted recently to scrap the SNSAs and revert to CEM and test every, with every year and every stage. So they're actually assessing more now than they would have been had they gone to SNSA. So it's, it's just a kind of point locally. Um, so Alice, I'd like to pick up on your point with regard to uh, educating teachers to use data well, which I thought was a really interesting one, because I think historically in Scottish education, uh, data has been used by management in schools. So principal teachers, uh, deputy head, um, you know, head teachers, and you spoke as well about the SSLN. Now, so when I was teaching, kids would be taken out of my class. I had no idea where they were going, and then they would suddenly appear back into the classroom. So, so that data to me as a practitioner was really unuseful. It, it was not great in terms of informing my understanding as a practitioner. Um, and I also note in uh, the OECD's um, 2011 review that it said without adequate training, teachers may not have the assessment literacy and ability to appropriately interpret results and to identify areas where curricular strategies may require adjustment. So I'd just like to ask a question around about teacher training and what kind of teacher training you think might be required to support teachers' understanding of this data. I think the, for my experience of working with teachers is the most useful um, education that they find is when they're actually working with real data from their, their, their children. So I think that there is, um, there is a job of work to be done where teachers don't just learn about assessments in the abstract, but they actually learn to navigate what's in what's in front of them and how and when they can take a deep dive and and actually look at the the, the granular information that, that's being provided i think one of the advantages of this assessment is that teachers do get the result instantly and they can click through and see the the the, the different um, ways that the particular children responded i think it's um so um yeah I can't remember what your question was. It was about training teachers to use the data. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I'd quite like to bring in Mary Shaw here because mm -hmm. I, I wonder, is there a consistent approach nationally as ADES got a view with regard to how this is um, monitored at local authority level, the teaching and the, uh, sorry, the, the training given to teachers to ensure that there is that parity of access um, to train them all up in, in the same way to give them a, a good understanding of what the data means? Because I think there is a bit of a gap at the moment between what this data will provide teachers with at the end and how it will help to inform their practice. Scholar is already providing that. So mm -hmm. Scholar, and I think the way that that, that, that is organised is we each have a link person from Scholar yeah. who that we can have a dialogue with to say this is where we're at. Yeah. Uh, that training is for head teachers and deputies. Uh -huh. uh, and, and I take your point about it not always being available to class teachers, mm -hmm. but the, the expectation is that it will be cascaded especially to those staff that would be using it who are in P1, 4 and 7. They wouldn't always be in those stages, of course. Yeah. 
uh, in primary schools in particular, secondaries probably have more experience in using attainment data uh, historically, obviously. And, um, but yet we are in East Renfrewshire very pleased, and I'm sure that uh, my colleagues uh, within ASDA, or, uh, ASDA, within ADEC, a bit of Freudian slip, <laughs> within ADEC, uh, are also um, appreciative of the information. And, and we are able to bespoke that. Yeah. Uh, our conversations are about, you know, well, our, our staff are already well versed in using blah, blah, blah. Let's see if we can sort of bring it about a more uh, granular use of it and so on. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think that is already in place and it's up to us as local authorities, of course, to make use of that. I think it might be worth going back to Scholar and asking Scholar to, to, to do some things that are standalone things that teachers can download off, off school premises, outside school time, and actually get the information that they need. And also, I mean, having things like um, checklists for local authorities and head, head teachers and teachers about what they know and what they don't know and, and where the, to, to identify where the gaps might be for assessment, because we don't really, um, we haven't, the, I, I think the rollout in terms of both initial teacher education and continuing professional development hasn't been quite as proactive as it could have been, but I think it hit the schools at a really, really busy time with PEF funding and a whole load of other things going on. So I think take two, there's our opportunity to actually improve that mm -hmm. growth mindset. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Could I uh, just add a bit actually what in my list of things that um, Scotland should be proud of, another one was what I mentioned earlier in that a training programme was initiated at the beginning of the assessment programme, which I think is a really um, innovative uh, move on the part of the Scottish Government. So um, what and what uh, Scholar is doing is developing the professional learning programme as the as the SNSA matures. So in the first year, a lot of it was about just um, how do I access the assessment? How do I assign um, logins for the children? Um, how do I download the reports and, and sort of more, the more technical dimension? Um, increasingly, the emphasis will be on interpretation of reports and, and what do I do with the information that I've got from the reports? So those, those programs are being developed at the moment and they are in fact available, not just in the face-to-face -face meetings, which are of course extremely important and um, you know, uh, probably more fun than sitting and looking at a webinar, but there are webinars as well. There are PowerPoints, there is text guidance um, on the platform for teachers to, to help them to um, become familiar with the assessment and how it might be used. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to go back to something you said, Julia. You mentioned the questionnaire that will be going out to teachers, um, I think, right at the start there. Will that questionnaire look to, um, I suppose, consider their experiences of uh, implementing the assessment? Um, one of the things that I've certainly come up with um, I, it's come up in conversation with a lot of my friends who are still teachers, um, is the provision of ICT in schools and the lack of opportunity to access appropriate ICT to deliver the assessment. Now, that's not a critique of the assessment itself. It's a critique of the uh, provision of ICT. So, you know, is that something you're going to consider? Yes, that, there is a section of questions about the ease of, um, of implementation in the yeah. classroom um, at, with the, um, whether, whether the school used the diagnostic assessment before the kids took the the assessment to make sure that they had the uh, appropriate level of equipment, um, how, the, how, how easy it was to get the children to log on, and all those questions, as well as the ones about the quality of the reports and so yeah. on. And Mary Shaw, is that something that ADES are looking at, that, you know, equality provision across the country in terms well, of ICT? It, it, it wouldn't necessarily be something that ADES would look at in terms of what the provision of ICT is in each individual local authority. But I think it's an important point that where, um, where Wi-Fi, for instance, yeah. isn't available, mm -hmm. Uh, it does make those assessments more high stakes if children have to be taken to ICT suites mm -hmm. to be able to undertake them. Uh, and therefore, um, we do need to be mindful that uh, where possible, it, it would be best done in tablet form or within the classroom to make them as low stakes as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly the advice that, that we would be giving to schools. Thank you. Um, just before I move on to my final colleague, can I, I just ask a little bit so I've got a better understanding of the use of standardised testings previous to this. So we've talked about the CEN test, but um, my own son went through 5 to 14, and I remember I'm talking about CAT testing in schools. To what extent are, are the, the, these being used by schools um, 
are there, from understanding of what you said, uh, Mary, that um, East Renfrewshire has its own developed model? Is there any other local authority that has its own developed model, or is everyone else using it commercially? And will the, the introduction of the, the new test sort of replace the data requirement or necessity for those CA and your CAT tests to take place? Uh, uh, my understanding was there were 24 local authorities that had that used the Durham assessments. I, I'm not sure. I think there were 31 in total local authorities that used some form of standardised assessment, although obviously not all the same ones. Um, I think the, certainly the publicity and the, uh, the advice around the introduction of the SNSAs would that it was that it was going to save local authorities money because they wouldn't need to continue with those. I can't speak for other local authorities as to whether or not they have stopped using their um, the assessments that they use at uh, or they used previously to SNSAs. But certainly, I would think that the intention would be that you wouldn't overassess children and that you would, but, but since we are involved in helping to shape and continue to shape the SNSAs until we get them into a sort of form that will be able to replace the assessments that we have. Does anyone else want to comment? That's, that's fine. I'm going to move okay. to um, my final colleague, Rona McKay. Thank you. Thanks, Kavira. I'm conscious of time, so I'll keep it very brief. Um, I was going to ask what you thought could be done to maximise the potential of, of these tests. And I'm really interested in something Professor Ellis said earlier on about the health and well-being of the, of the child. And clearly, these tests don't provide that kind of data. Is this something you think should be done? Is this something that could be done easily with perhaps maybe just a few extra questions on the test? Schools or? do collect health and wellbeing um, um, data. You know, a lot of them will use the Shinari wheels, and um, they will ask children about their friendships. They'll ask them how they feel about the curriculum. They'll ask them how they feel about different aspects of, of, of learning in the curriculum. They'll ask them how they feel about coming to school, all sorts of things. So um, that data exists. Um, oh, sorry, where does that data go? I mean, who, get, who, who sees that? In, you know, well, that will be kept at school level. Yeah. Um, and um, that, that exists at school level. So, and even in local authorities where all the schools are doing that, what we found was that the um, the schools where they had one where, where they had their progression meetings with teachers to talk about the planning for the class and what the class needed and what individual children maybe needed, um, where the head teacher actually had all that data and they talked about all that data together, those children seemed to be happier and make better progress than where those meet that data was kept quite separate and discussed in separate meetings. Okay. So should, do you think this should be included as part of the assessment? No. No. It should be kept separate. I think there are some things that you just, you need to keep it simple mm -hmm. <laughs> and good enough is good enough. Mm -hmm. I think that there are points where you actually just have to say to teachers, this is really complicated, you're the professional, you pull it all together. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to be learning from schools that seem to do that really, really well. and be promoting that as maybe possibly good ways forward for others to others to follow in their data use. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's good. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to say I've got a final supplementary <laughs> from Joanne Lawrence. You're quite right to be afraid to say that. Um, forgive me, but thank you very much for allowing me back in. Just very briefly to ask a question. I mean, there's the suggestion that this is like a, a political battle and ideological battle and so on. Would you accept that the debate is really about the balance between the benefits of these tests against the consequence or the costs to local authorities or to individual schools in running them. Because what the evidence the committee round the experience of, of, of teachers, of people with uh, parent or carers, with young people with learning needs, additional support needs, has been that those needs are not being met currently. There are a number of reports which would suggest that schools are under huge pressure, there's fewer and fewer um, support staff to support teachers in doing their job. I wonder whether there comes a point where if the consequence of running these tests is not so much that there are more resources, as was suggested, I think, by a colleague from ADES, that you identify a need and you bring in resource, but actually resource has been taken away from that in order to deliver those tests. 
Do you accept that that's what's been said by many people at school level, that the consequence of running the tests is that support staff have been taken in order to do that? And if you believe that to be the case, or you accept that to be the case, are there other policy choices? So, in terms of a school exercising leadership, would it be reasonable for a primary school head to say the consequence of running these tests, which may theoretically be good, is that there is less support for young people in the classroom? And if that's the case, I will exercise leadership and say these tests are not a priority. Yeah, I, I think that. I mean, I think that goes back to that ICT question as well about whether or not um, the it is it is opportune to, or, or whether there is opportunity for the test to be administered in a classroom setting without taking children to another setting, and who would do that? I'm not sure that that I haven't heard comments about them being linked to um, uh, Just, pupil support assistance. Well, for for. Um, Pupil of support for, for assistants for, who are allocated context. to schools for uh -huh. the purpose of ASN. Uh -huh. There context. will be other pupil of support assistants who may use that, who would come under the category, for instance, of classroom assistants, as opposed to you, those who are there for but particular children. They're all now categorised respect as classroom assistants, as we've learned from the statisticians. It's, it's a genuine question. I'm, I'm not told, sure that that's accurate, actually. But, uh, but um, well, if I, I am told anecdotally by people who work in schools primary teachers in particular and additional support staff under phenomenal pressure are saying that these tests are bringing added pressure and taking them away from their core job of supporting young people in the classroom. If that were true, if we could evidence that in a way that would satisfy you, would, you, would your view be that you should be making different policy choices and that your first priority would not be managing these tests, but would be to ensure that schools are properly resourced to support young people um, in their learning, and particularly young people with additional support needs, the reports that have been given to this committee? I have to say, I think that's an unfair question. I think to ask uh, us to say that the information that you would gain from um, such from, from such assessments against supporting particular and individual children, they shouldn't necessarily be um, an either or. They shouldn't be, but if no. somebody tells you that they are being at a local, in classrooms, in schools, in primary schools, people are making that choice, would it mean that you would want to reflect again on the importance of the priority given to the policy of be, Being a solution-focused person, I would find a solution. Would that involve further resource? I would find a solution. Which may include further resources. I would find a solution. Thank you. Anyone else got final thoughts? Uh, on that basis, can I thank everyone for um, their attendance on the panel this morning? It's been a, a quite a long session and we really appreciate um, you coming along this morning. Um, I'm going to suspend for five minutes as we do have to go back into private session and, and allow the witnesses to leave. Thank you. Thank you.